on uh, conceptualizations, which this is a strand of. So it's identity and conceptualization because they didn't really know where to put this talk, I don't think. Uh, it's a largely theoretical account, uh, ge a genealogical account using uh, sort of Foucauldian post structuralist analysis of both psychology and sociology, which is something I'm trying to integrate in my PhD work, um, to come to an understanding, a better understanding of sexual prejudice. So, in 1968, uh, Henri Teifel gave a paper called The Cognitive Aspects of Prejudice at the Eugenic Society, which was held in this city in London. Uh, it was the fifth annual symposium of the Eugenic Society, a kind of unusual place, one might think, uh, that one delivers a, uh, a paper on prejudice. But um, Teifel, it's a very unusual paper for Teifel as well. It's not really that much on the cognitive aspects of prejudice. It cites a lot of social anthropology. Shortly before this, John Rex, who was one of the leading sociologists working on racial prejudice, um, gave his account of race as a social category um, and really race as constructed um, and cites a lot of very typical structural sociology to account for people's racial differences. So these two men, I'm kind of baffled as to why they didn't actually cite each other's work at all in the rest of their careers. This was both in 1968, they both were at the same place, one spoke before the other, and I'm interested in reconciling both of these, these people's work really, um, and coming to an understanding of sexual prejudice. So going back even further, if we, our understandings of prejudice come from largely when we think of prejudice in psychology, we think of Gordon Allport and the nature of prejudice. And he was certainly influential in influencing how we think about the cognitive aspects of prejudice and things like cognitive biases, uh, which account for pr uh, why people hate other people, basically. And this was developed further by Thomas Pettigrew with the ultimate attribution era, where after the, the kind of paradigm shift of the cognitive re revolution, and um, yeah, I'll just skip over this. But in fact, when we go back even further, from 1954 was the nature of prejudice when that was published. If we go back even further into 1950, we get the first account, which was by a sociologist of the Frankfurt School, Theodore Adorno, there he is with Horkheimer, who also edited this volume. This is a psychoanalytic work, which is the first to attempt to link personality and prejudice. So they came up with the F scale of, um, F for fascism, of course, which is the kind of elephant in the room in a lot of um, discussions about prejudice, because these, these two men were essentially refugees from fascism. They had to flee Frankfurt to California, which is where this book was written. Um, and this was then later picked up by Bob Altemeyer um, in, in Canada, who again is just going back to the starting point of European fascism and how this very much was influential and again linking and coming up with right-wing authoritarianism as a personality construct. Um, which became hugely influential, particularly in, if you look at um, uh, Duckett's 2001 model, which was a perhaps the most uh, cited explanation of prejudice, which is a kind of dual process uh, motivation and uh, ideology. Link. Social psychology's contribution, Henri Teifel comes back again with uh, John Turner in Bristol, and they posit, I'm sure everyone has heard of this, social identity theory, which is deals with uh, the theory of intergroup conflict, and is a kind of a bridge between um, this and more sociological work, which deals with social groups, but of course uh, sociology on a macro level deals with social structures. So we reach the kind of contemporary, this is an excellent book by Dixon and Levine. Um, they tie all of these things together and include the most contemporary research on unconscious biases, which is uh, something that um, uh, somebody gave a presentation on yesterday, uh, particularly in equality and diversity training. But this is kind of gets back, gets away from the more scientific accounts, I would say, and situates it in social justice, which is really where prejudice has to has to has to be situated. I, I would argue, and away from a more scientific account. 
So yeah, I'm just going to move on very, very quickly to sociology. There's not that much sociology in this. Um, if, we, if we look back even further in sociology, 1899, W.B. Du Bois was writing very, very critical work on race, on deconstructing race uh, as a social category, arguing that it was a historical differences and not, uh, and not any, any differences in terms of the color of people's skin and things like that. Um, and then we skip forward in time to 1958, and we have Harold Bloomer, who absolutely tears to shreds any sort of personality notions of uh, racial prejudice, and posits it as a sense of group position, and his group threat um, hypothesis as to why people hate each other um, as a difference in terms of social groups is still very influential in psychology as well. Um, of course, feminists have very much to say uh, about oppression, as I believe women are perhaps the most oppressed social group. Um, so, Simone de Beauvoir completely deconstructs the, uh, the, any essentialist notions of womanhood. We have Judith Butler, who questions the, the ontology of women as the subject of feminism itself in Gender Trouble. Um, and Leslie McCall, uh, a lesser known author who highlights the complexity of intersectionality. Who We have people like Kimberly Crenshaw, who unifies a lot of the work that Angela Davis set down. Uh, initially, I'm just going to be very, very quickly. So I'm.